I'm, I'm particularly excited to be uh, introducing our next speakers who've served our industry exceptionally well. First up, we have another media legend, Wenda Harris Millard. Wenda will be moderating the Global Media Holding Company CEO chat, where we will have Daryl Sim, Chairman and CEO of Omnicom Media Group, and Dominic Proctor, President, Global Group M. And they'll discuss their perspectives on the pressing business priorities in the industry. Let's have a round of applause for Daryl and Dominic. Thank you very much for both being here. Whilst they come up on stage, I'll introduce them. So Daryl joined Omnicom in 1998 to establish its first media agency network, OMD Worldwide. And prior to joining Omnicom, Daryl spent 13 years at P&G, where he was VP of Worldwide Media and Programming and the head of P&G Productions. So welcome, Daryl. And up on the stage with Daryl is the president of Group M Global, Dominic Proctor. Group M is the holding company for all of WPP's media agencies, including Maxis, MEC, Mediacom, and Mindshare, and as well as um, another, uh, uh, many of the other uh, specialist media operations. Before that, Dominic was founding CEO of Mindshare, and earlier than that, media director of J. Walter Thompson. So welcome, Dominic. And uh, before I hand over to, to Wenda, I'd just like to point out that the two gentlemen on stage on behalf of their agencies, represent more than half of all the media investment globally. That's a handy $300 billion. So it's no exaggeration to say that we're extremely interested in what they're having to say. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you, John. Good morning, everyone. I am very honored uh, to have been asked to moderate our talk today with veteran executives who run two of the largest media agency networks in the world. Why? because they have the best seats in the house. There are many perspectives on the modern marketplace, but media agencies see the whole picture. In the past two decades, as nearly everything in our industry transformed beyond recognition, media agencies have been a steady hand at the helm. They have become indispensable guides to clients in a time of turbulent change. The go-to resource for insights and innovative thinking two essential ingredients for a success in a digitally enabled world. And frontline fighters in the buying trenches battling to transform effectively as a new data-driven media hierarchy takes shape around us. From spectacular Super Bowl buys to stunningly engaging interactive billboards, from brand entertainment to content creation to native advertising, there isn't an aspect of our media landscape that media agencies aren't deeply involved with. They lead clients' integrated teams, and they are the first to experiment. They drive awareness and change around fraud, viewability, and a host of other critically important issues to our industry. And not incidentally, media agencies are potent profit centers for their holding company parents. 20 years ago, when agencies unbundled their media departments, the catalyst was the need to aggregate clout to negotiate with media companies bulking up through merger and acquisition. But these new entities were also fortuitously positioned to take on the internet-fueled technological transformation that was about to descend upon us all. Our two speakers were there as it happened, leading their agencies through that maelstrom. Dominic Proctor, global CEO of Group M, launched Mindshare Worldwide, WPP's first media agency, in 1997, and today he presides over the largest media agency network in the world. Daryl Sim, chairman and CEO of Omnicom Media Group, was on a, one of Unbundling's first architects. He was vice president of media and programming for Procter & Gamble when he was wooed away in 1998 to form Omnicom's media agency network. I know that we will all benefit from what these two leaders will share with us now about media, past, present, and future. So let's begin. So as, as we said, like uh, most unbundled entities, uh, originally Mindshare and, and Omnicom Media Group were formed to aggregate buying clout. But since then, as we've, we've heard this morning and, and throughout this conference, the role of media services shop has evolved dramatically. So let me ask you, what, what today is job one? Is it, as Tim Armstrong just said, to focus on the value proposition? Or how, how would you describe job one in 2015? 
Well, I think job one, you have to go back to the roots of the media agency because it transcends uh, data, it transcends technology, it transcends digital and all the various uh, parts of it. But I want to push back on what you said in terms of the really the founding cornerstones of the unbundled media agency. I, I think that one of the products of uh, unbundling has been there have been some large media agencies uh, created, but I don't believe that was the cornerstone of the development of the media agency. We put together one of our agencies using two uh, advertising agency media departments because those two departments actually, when we looked at the agencies, had complementary great global reach to create a, a, a network. But equally, there are many of our, uh, of our other agencies, like our PhD operation, which were founded out of one office uh, that was connected to a BBDO office in, in, in London. Uh, other media agencies that are large companies uh, today were founded out of one advertising uh, uh, agency. If it was about scale, where would Bill Konigsberg <laughs> be uh, today? That, and uh, how would he have built his company uh, to where it is uh, today? I think the, 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 the foundation here was very much, and I say this uh, looking back in my client days at, uh, at Procter & Gamble, where we used a lot of different media departments of uh, full service agencies. What we were looking for was the best operation that could provide neutrality. Neutrality and decisions that were unfettered by one agency or another agency's uh, skill set in uh, one particular media type or not, or the uh, opinions of uh, an account team or a creative team in terms of uh, where their work should be shown, what was uh, appropriate. So neutrality um, was certainly, uh, when I was making those decisions from the client side, an extremely important part of the decision-making process of why we as a client were going to unbundle our media relationships and, and, uh, and pitch it and look at uh, different um, uh, media operations that ultimately came from, originally came from, uh, from, from, uh, from ad agencies. And that neutrality, I think, is what we're in the client service business at the end of the day. The, cl the clients are looking for us to aggregate the very best in terms of resources and ultimately de deliver them strategic advice and, uh, and plans and activations that uh, provide the best results for their brands. So at the end of the all day. those years that you and I negotiated, whether it was at DoubleClick or Yahoo and all that, you weren't, you, you weren't honest with me about clout. <laughs> hey, I, well, I, we'll do what it, you know, from, uh, uh, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> there maybe you not. go. There you go. I will defend Daryl's honesty. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Exactly. We're partners in this. So, so Dominic, would that uh, for for you is that is that job one today, or or is that does that hold in terms well, of? Well, first of all, I, mean, I agree with Daryl's um, challenge to your to your question because actually the origins of what we now call media agencies wasn't, I think, just the. Um, uh, just the putting together of scale. It was actually because there were a bunch of people then preceding the development of the WPP agencies, I should say, who were truly visionaries who realized that um, for as long as they stayed in what were then full service agencies in media departments, they were never ever going to have the, the investment to advise the clients properly on how to make their um, marketing and media decisions that was always in the back room. And I mean, I have to say at that time, I'm, I had a job which was running a full service advertising agency and I absolutely knew that my point of difference was not the media department. I mean, maybe that was foolish looking back, but it's true at the time it wasn't. It was the creative work that came out of the agency that differentiated my company from, from one in Omnicom, for example. So yes, I think aggregated scale and clout, as you put it, uh, became a battleground uh, for the agencies, but it wasn't the primary motive. The primary motive was to give the media function the due prominence that it uh, warranted. And, and, I, and we shouldn't that, forget that. It, would you say today that that is still job one? I, I don't think that job has been achieved, no. I think, well, let me put it this way. I think um, a lot of the work that um, we set out to achieve has been achieved. Where, where I think we've been bad as an industry, as a media agency uh, industry, is properly explaining that sometimes and marketing that to our clients and to the broader community. I think we haven't been particularly good at explaining the real value that firms like our firm and Daryl's mm -hmm. company. So, that, and that's exactly what, what Tim and Bill were talking about. Yeah, exactly, about, yeah, no, that's right. Value I mean, we're better at marketing other people's mm -hmm. uh, uh, products than our own sometimes, and that's something we need to address. And what about the, the clients during these extraordinary uh, 
20 years of, of transformation. Um, are client expectations today uh, of what you do and how you do it, are they very different? Well, I think they're just much more exaggerated than they were. I mean, I think what's happened in those 20 years, I mean, this is obvious, it's self-evident, is that the revolution really precipitated by digital has made the whole world out there just far, far, far more chaotic for clients. And ever more, therefore, they need people who can advise them on how to navigate that chaotic world. And that's actually not a bad thing for us in the sense that the more chaos there is, the more the market there is for advice. Right? It keeps all of us employed. It, well, it does. And I think the, 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 the privileged position of the media agency now, which perhaps wasn't the case 20 years ago, is that if we get it right, then we can see the whole picture. Mm -hmm. I think you said that in your introductory remarks. Right. I mean, there are, there are very few other kinds of company out there who can genuinely see the whole picture, the whole marketing landscape, all of the opportunities, and then have the wherewithal and intelligence to advise clients how best to take those opportunities, so the thinking and the execution. So if ever the time was right, if ever the time was now for, uh, for, for marketing the value of what we do, it is now, I would say, because of the chaos. As a result of the uh, things that Dominic's just, uh, just touched on, I think client expectations have increased substantially because they recognize that in this uh, fragmented, fluid, uh, data-driven uh, environment that we're operating um, on their behalf, um, they're expecting us to come through with strategic recommendations, strategic decisions that can drive their business in much more powerful ways than the process measures I would say they were using. They were using in the uh, they were using in the in the in the past. So, the, the, it it drives I think um, it both inspires us and it uh, it challenges us challenges us in terms of um, uh, increasing the level of confidence of our organizations to really deliver against those expectations, being in the front seat, if you will, um, in an in, in audience first kind of, uh, kind of environment. What, what are, are some of the, the specific questions that, that clients ask you today? Because we, we can, can talk a lot about um, you know, data and technology and, and the changes that, um, that those things uh, have, have caused, but what, what is it that clients are really asking you more on a more specific basis? I think, um, I think the most basic questions are the same as they've always been, actually, Wenda. I just think they're far more complicated and difficult to answer, right? So the basic questions are, how much shall I spend and how shall I spend it? Mm -hmm. Now, the answer's more complicated because the options uh, are just far more, well, they're infinite, almost. And, Therefore, the onus on us has been to invest in the, um, the people and the technology to allow us to make much more uh, accurate judgments about the, um, the ROI. Um, again, having seen the whole picture, coming back to that, I mean, if you have the breadth uh, within your business to look at all of the options available and the investment capital to invest in the people and the technology to inform your answers, then the answers can be more accurate, but the questions are actually pretty much the same as they were when I started. I don't know if you're. Yeah, I, 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 well, I certainly the the focus is on ROI. I think our, you know, our clients experience some of the same pressures that we do as a category of business. That um, uh, growth over the past uh, few years hasn't been as strong as they were hoping for, um, uh, both in terms of their own businesses and the budgets that, budgets that support um, those businesses. So there's a great. Um, uh, focus and a lot of questions about ROI. How can um, data help me improve my, my ROI? What can I do in the programmatic space to get lift? Um, uh, there's, I would say, um, as we chase data, one of the, the challenges that we have uh, in terms of guiding our clients is that balance between short-term lift using the data and brand building using the, uh, uh, using the data because, boy, there, that, that is like a drug, the ability to drive ROI it, it, in the short term. because you can't but, but can you're, measure everything. Right, you're, right. Uh, you're spending the equity, um, and you can do that for a while. You can yeah. spend the equity for, uh, uh, for, for a while. Um, but, uh, you know, counseling our clients in that space, to me, finding that sweet spot is uh, in, in uh, between delivering those short-term results and being able to deliver those same short-term results 12 months from now mm -hmm. uh, for them is, is, uh, is, yeah. is a challenge. So, so do you yeah. think the, the um, is it fair to say that there's not enough focus on building brand strength for the, for the long run because we are obsessed with I mean, data and the opportunity yeah, to I think, measure? Uh, 
I think they can be. I think Daryl's right again on that. I think, uh, you know, on the, it, this, might, this might sound perverse, because on the one hand, we need to be clever enough to be able to measure things. But on the other hand, if we only value things that we can measure, mm -hmm. then we're going down the wrong street, right? So you have to be able to do both. And if you like, one represents brand building, and one might, present, might represent you know, the precision of decision making uh, you know, based on data. Those two things um, <clears throat> can be in conflict if you're not careful. Then you can be distracted, um, particularly by clients who are under significant commercial pressure to take the easy route. And the easy route often is the one which is measurable while, rather than the one that's always right. You, I, I find you often have uh, situations where uh, to the point of, you know, clients that might be or have businesses that are unfortunately struggling and we're doing <coughs> everything we can to help support those businesses, but data can become a safety net or, oh, de no or default mm -hmm. uh, yeah. to, to uh, as a replacement for strategic uh, uh, decision making as opposed to an inspiration for more innovation, for more insights that Absolutely. can uh, help build the uh, upper funnel of the, uh, and, uh, and of the brand. And I think, you know, we heard a little bit about talent in the, in the mm -hmm. last conversation. Uh, and I just do wonder, are, are we uh, bringing up a, a generation, uh, you know, with our, in our own companies, whether it's the agency, you know, or on the client side, where um, there is no appreciation for uh, the art of our business? Interestingly, there is no art museum in Silicon Valley, by the way. <laughs> no art museums. And are we raising a, a generation of folks in this business who honestly believe that absolutely everything is measurable and don't okay. understand the value of building that? Product? I mean, perhaps in Silicon Valley is the answer to that, because if you work in Silicon Valley and one of the big firms over there, then you tend to have a view of the world that is driven by data, and not just data, but your own data, and only your own data. So you have a narrow view of life, and a narrow view of life might not include art, right? I go back to the point that I made earlier on, therefore, that the benefit that we can bring, if we get it right, is a broader view, which does include an art museum. So I think if you are in Silicon Valley, if you are in one of the massive technology-based media vendors over there, then your view of life tends to be rather narrow. I'm bullish on the talent that we have in the, in the business, and I would say that my view of that has changed pretty significantly over the past five or six years. When we first started, I would say, toying with uh, data and, and looking at its potential, but very much looking at it down a silo with our, with our blinders on. And I, when I look at the talent, the diversity of talent, and when I say diversity, I'm, I'm talking about both functional diversity, uh, gender diversity, mm -hmm. age diversity, ethnicity diversity uh, of every kind, but certainly at the younger levels, the individuals that we're bringing into the organization that are in their mid and later 20s now and have really experienced social media on the leading edge um, are, uh, are the most inspirational people in some ways that we have in the organization in terms of... I find it humbling. <laughs> absolutely. In terms of the... Uh, uh, the great uh, creative ideas that uh, they're capable of uh, weaving together across platform. So I am from a, look, as I said earlier, we're in the, the client service business. That's our job to bring those ideas uh, to uh, our clients and not to get locked into um, a being a one trick uh, pony in this space and, uh, and balancing um, all of those uh, qualities is extremely important. As I said, I, from a talent standpoint, yeah. I'm, I'm very bullish uh, yeah. in terms of what's coming in to the agencies. And you as well, Dominic? Yeah, definitely bullish. I think the challenge is really, um, as Daryl alluded to is, to, is to find the wherewithal within our own companies, within our own P&Ls, to afford the diversity of talent that we need to drive the companies uh, forward. Um, and it really is, because when you're looking for talent, uh, in a media firm, in a media agency, you're looking for a very broad range of talent. You know, you need the artist to sit next to the scientist, right? And that means that you need the artist and the scientist to prefer to come and work for you than to go and work for an art specialist or a science specialist. And so you're looking essentially for uh, people who'd rather work in a team, right? And then the job of the agency is to integrate that team. And that's quite challenging, just purely actually from a financial point of view, where traditionally our legacy is 
is that we don't pay entry-level graduates often as much as those specialist firms might do, and therefore they might attract, attract some of the... That's been an issue that's plagued this industry. Yeah, and I don't, you know, if, so if we're going to be self-critical, I don't think we've particularly cracked that issue. But By the way, not just here in the US, but I'd say that was, mm -hmm. a, that was a global challenge that we have. We're not, we haven't found a way of re-engineering our balance sheets in general for us to be the first port of call purely on a financial basis for, for, pe for yeah. people who have a choice. And, and, and I think what ultimately uh, can get us to that very important place in terms of providing just a higher level of, uh, of strategic value is what I believe is the inevitable move from, um, uh, I saw um, uh, Mark Pritchard of Procter & Gamble speak at a recent conference and he talked about process measure, measures versus business measures. Mm -hmm. When I see a client at that level talking about the importance of getting to business measures, uh, I find that very inspiring for our business because when, when we're proving that we can deliver value to the business is when we can get our, get our businesses in a place where we ought to be able to recruit and afford the kind of talent at entry yeah. level. So that can prove out those kind of delivery uh, and outcomes um, for our clients. Yeah. Do you feel that that you are still driving change for your clients, or do you feel that that they're really driving the change and asking for it, or is it, is this a, a a collaborative effort? Certainly, one of the the most important themes of this conference. Are your relationships with clients more collaborative than they've ever been? I. Well, I mean, it's an interesting question. I, I would say that the principal driver of change is neither the agency nor the client. The principal driver of change is the media and marketing environment, if you mm -hmm. like. The media landscape is the thing that drives change, and, um, we, and we've, we've reacted to it. Now, if your question then becomes, well, who's taking the lead in reacting to that, then I think it's incumbent on the agency to do that, because, you know, as Tim alluded to in his uh, talk just now, um, you know, if, if agencies don't have the, the intelligence and the uh, wherewithal to, to bring that talent in who can lead the change, then the clients will do it for themselves, right? And, the, and an agency doesn't have a right to exist, particularly if they're not doing things that a client couldn't do for himself, for less. Yeah, I thought, I thought Tim's uh, conversation about, um, you know, working, agencies working more closely um, with media companies like, like his. I thought that was very interesting because I think we, uh, in this industry, have a tendency um, to try to bifurcate either or, black and white, uh, zero sum. And I was thinking about this question about who's really driving change. Uh, you know, Tim, that right there, you saw that, you know, he's a, he's a driver yeah, of right. change. And I think what, what we've learned, um, you know, sort of since the beginning of the, the digital revolution is that change and innovation really can come from from anywhere. Sure. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, to the point Dom was making, not to re repeat it, but consumers are what are driving change, right? Consumers yeah. are driving change. What we're doing is both anticipating and trying to stay slightly ahead of consumers, but following their general behavior is, 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 is what we're doing. And because that behavior has resulted in a much more fragmented landscape mm -hmm. in terms of touch point, in terms of the opportunity for one-to-one -one relationships and, and, uh, and whatnot, it's become not just complex, but it's requiring a different level of collaboration uh, across agencies than what we've, what we've seen before. And there is no question when we do our best work for a client and the client sees the best results, the collaboration has occurred. It may have occurred in different ways, but it has occurred, whether it's a unified team or you know, more often than not, um, a client which would I, w that has what I simply call confidence, confidence in themselves, confidence in their brand and what it stands for. Uh, when a client has that, uh, uh, they um, kind of fuel collaboration across the agencies because we, um, we can all take inspiration from the data and believe in it behind their, behind their uh, leadership across their, uh, their agency partners. So. Um, but uh, yeah, it's consumers that drive mm -hmm. this and the need for collaboration. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I, mean, I think it's very almost, easy to get Almost no clients that I've ever come across in recent years who want to see their agencies fighting. Right, of course, of course. Yeah. But I do think we, we have a tendency, and it's understandable, to get a little bit lost in the technology um, and forget that technology is simply the facilitator in, in, yeah. of what's it's driving that consumer in uh, the red ocean. change, yeah. behavioral yeah. change. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let, let's play word association for, um, for a minute. I have, I have um, three. When I say purchasing department, 
you say procurement. And remember, this may be recorded. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll change my answer. I, I say process measures, procurement process measures. Okay. Not necessarily business outcomes. Right. I'd, 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 say, I'd say bring it on. I mean, we welcome it. I, I, I think, um, you know, if I was a client, I would, I would, my ambition would, have to, would be to have the absolute best procurement or process department in the industry, bar none, and to have that staffed by experts, not generalists, and to have, and to have them uh, fairly judge and pay my agency, and I'd want to be the client to whom the best talent in my agency want to gravitate towards. I think they're a force for good when they're right. So we've talked a little bit about this, but you know, just sort of in the, in the wordplay, when I say data, you say? Fundamental. Insights. Insights, ah. You know, that, that expression, you know, data is the new black. Now, that, we, we were so wrong on that. It, it's the derivative of that data. Oh, absolutely. It, it is the, the, the consumer the, insight. Right, it's the consumer insight. It's, it's the mm -hmm. talent that you apply to the data. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you get a lot of observations from data. Um, and uh, sometimes insights get confused with uh, observations with that the, are not. With the mass of, yeah. Um, but uh, in terms of getting our businesses, uh, media agency business, to a place where they're really providing strategic value, um, we've got to have that insights happening on every client team that we have in our company. And we, we've organized around that to make it happen. Uh, does that mean it's happening to the degree that I would like on every uh, team? No, but it is the future of, uh, of really providing strategic value. So that actually that leads very well into the, the next question that I, I uh, wanted to ask you both is, as you look forward, um, and we're in a state of constant transformation uh, and innovation, what are the couple of things that you would do um, to transform the agency uh, for success in the, in the future? You know, I think, Daryl, you just partly answered that. Yeah. Um, but what else do you feel is going to drive success for you as, as we look forward? I, I mean, in addition to, to insights, and this is very closely related to it, but it's, uh, it's industry and, and uh, company confidence. And confidence. Yeah, absolutely. So if we, if we look at where we sit in this uh, ecosystem of, uh, of data, of technology, of consumer behavior, um, of uh, insights and innovation, the opportunity to drive, great, drive creativity. As uh, Dom was saying at the outset, we're in a, we're in a great, great place here. The, the reality is on, on most of our businesses, even when we're doing great work on a client that we're very, that we're very proud of, we do not demonstrate the level of, uh, I would say, confidence and gravitas and certainty that you might have expected out of a great creative agency in terms of um, working with its uh, working with its clients and making certain recommendations on the uh, on the on on the way forward, and uh, I think that's part of uh, kind of uh, you know grabbing the the brass ring that we have. Uh, so where, where did we lose that, or, or or how did we lose that? Well, I, I don't think that we I don't think that we uh, lost it in the uh, in the media agency space. I think we're getting it. In yeah. the media agency space, okay. I think we're, I think we're, we're, you know, because of where we sit, um, we realize that not only do we have an opportunity, but frankly, we have a responsibility to our clients to uh, to recommend what we believe is right and uh, yeah. and push forward with it and uh, and debate our recommendation uh, as opposed to take instructions. And, you know, and they're expecting that of us. And, you know, just picking up on that, I mean, to also have the confidence and the responsibility to properly grow our companies for the benefit of our own companies, as well as the benefit of our clients, because I think unless you have uh, an industry sector that is confident enough to grow itself and mm -hmm. to become more uh, profitable and more interesting for clients, then how on earth can we invest back into the business to do what the clients are saying they want, right? So I think part of the confidence issue that Daryl um, just referred to is the, in, is, the, is the media agency business, having the confidence and then having the pride Right, to grow our businesses in the way perhaps that in the mists of time going back into Mad Men, the advertising agencies perhaps once had. Yeah, and it's not that we don't have that talent in the agencies today, it's right. just getting the consistency yeah. of that talent across the, uh, across the board is the mm -hmm. key. Yeah. Well, it's interesting also because I, I think, you know, sometimes we forget this is a, a relatively new yeah. 
industry. Yeah. You know, the agent, and, and we forget, you know, sort of in yeah, the day-to-day -day and sort of this combination of volume and velocity um, mm -hmm. that we're living in in, in terms of, of change. Uh, we forget it is it is relatively new. It is, and I and I think the challenge that we have going back to the beginning is that I think the outputs that are coming from the business uh, are in front of the perception sometimes that we that we've uh, that we that we've put out there. So we have time for one one last question, and I I, I think we would be uh, remiss if we didn't um, share with the audience some of your your global perspectives. You both have uh, have global global assignments. Um, where, when you look at, at the U.S. and the rest of the world, where do you see us uh, as being, being ahead uh, of other countries or, or regions, and where do we lag? I, I think when you look at the, uh, the ahead, it's, it's driven um, both by the sophistication of, of, of marketing in general in the, in the U.S., but also by the availability of data. And, uh, and our ability to put that into technology and, uh, and get to results, get to insights, get to following consumers more effectively. So we're definitely seeing, I would say, uh, uh, more sophisticated layers of uh, digital, whether it's programmatic, whether it's mobile, whether it's social, you know, all the way through, uh, I hate to call it all digital because it's not. They're, they're so distinct, um, the, the layers. Um, and th there's no question. Uh, that, that on that sophistication scale, the U.S. is ahead, no doubt about it. Yeah. Um, on the, and, you know, we, we may see other markets where, quote, digital is a very large part of the uh, spend, sure. or a larger part of the spend than in the U.S. We did our world tour in uh, November doing our profit plans, uh, my CFO and I, and, uh, you know, there's one of our top five markets where now uh, digital is uh, significantly higher than television, you know, 10 points higher than television in terms of amazing. Uh, they move in a very short period of time in that market. I th I'd say where other markets are, 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 uh, are ahead is also defined by the, by the environment. So if you look at um, some, whether they're sophisticated markets or not, a lot of markets, the entire market rotates around a pretty similar culture, around one major city in, in, a, in a market that defines business in that environment. And what we see in those markets are really great creative ideas, whether conventional, digital, or otherwise, or social, that really touch consumers. In large part, it's because the people that are doing the work commute, live, breathe, conduct their leisure time in that environment, and they really get the culture yeah. um, uh, of it. But it inspires us to think, what could we be doing in major centers of the U.S.? You know, what could we be doing uh, in a, uh, you know, in a, in, in a San Francisco, in a Boston, in a New York, in an L.A.? And I would agree with that, Darren. I also, I mean, just I also think that it's for another reason too, which is that in, you know, I think in the U.S. sometimes the opportunity, the scale of the of the business here, right, is is so phenomenal. That, um, that often it can lead to a conformity of answer, right? What, what I think breeds the creativity that you would witness on a, on a, kind of, on a tour around in Asia, for example, or in Latin America, is that um, often when it comes to creativity, necessity is the mother of invention where there is no budget. You know, there, we have no money, therefore we have to think. And yeah, scale, and, scale, scale can yes, sometimes it's almost, be the enemy it's almost, as well. You could say in the US, perhaps sometimes you think, well, you know, we, you know, when, you, when you've got your annual budget and you're doing your plan, you should just chop off a piece and pretend you haven't got it, right? And then think about that piece rather than spend that piece because I think, that, that, I think scale can get in the way of creativity if you're not careful. Well, unfortunately, we, we are out of time, but I, I do want to thank Dominic and Beryl for your, uh, for your participation and your, your generous uh, thoughts during this conversation. So thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Linda.